If you'll turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, while you're turning there, I need to just do one quick thing. Uh, the youth uh, are going to go to Falls Creek, and first of all, praise the Lord for the youth. It's great to see all y'all here this evening. Uh, going to go to Falls Creek, and this is the contract that we're going to send them, and uh, Richard is going to write a, a check in order to cover this. Yes, you, you have to. And uh, so I wanted to bring it to your attention that they will go to Falls Creek the first week of June. And uh, uh, this is the contract that says we're going to show up and pay the bill, which we will do. Okay, um, this uh, message this evening is, uh, is a conclusion to the series that we started uh, several weeks ago uh, titled Developing the Christian Life. Now, if you're in uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, tell us uh, the characteristics that ought to be present in our life uh, as a Christian, uh, that every uh, one of us should have. And in fact, in verse 8, we'll see that it ought to be growing. So at Second Peter chapter 1, let's read verses 5 through 8. It says, Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence, in your faith supplying moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. And then verse 8 tells us what is the result if these things are prevalent in, in our life. For if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at those eight characteristics, the last one is love. You see, love is the greatest of all of these. In fact, Jesus said that if we love, love God and love uh, others, those are the two greatest commandments, and it's all wrapped up in the one word called love. And so we need to, this evening, examine our hearts to see, first of all, if, if we have a love for God, and then secondly, if we have a love for others. Let's begin our time with a uh, word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you that you first loved us, and because you love us, you call us to you and to be in your family. And Lord, I pray that as we look into our own hearts, we would see ourselves as you see us. And I pray that every one of us, first of all, have a love for you and then have a love for each other. Because if we do, then we will be used of you to make a difference in the lives of those around us and in this community. And for that, we give thanks and glory unto you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, what I want to do this evening is bring your attention to four areas of love as it's used in this passage that we just read. Now, the first of this is the meaning of love. We need to first talk about the meaning of love. Two things here. First of all, love is an emotion. It's an emotion, and we can get this from two Greek words. The first one is eros, which means fleshly love. And eros is the kind of uh, love that you, uh, that, that you initially have for your spouse. It's that physical attraction that uh, two people, when they begin to fall in love, first experience. It's a fleshly love. And it's also a fellowship love. And the word, the Greek word there is philia, which we get from our city, Philadelphia, brotherly love. This fellowship love is the love that we have for uh, one another. This love that enables us to, to work in the kingdom of God, to support and encourage each other. But it is an emotion. Uh, love is. It's also an experience. Love is an experience. And we have two Greek words here. The first one is storge, which means a family love. Now, the love that I have for my family, particularly my three girls, is a, is a slightly different love than I have for the fellow brethren, for you all. It's still love, but it's, it's, it's a little bit different, and that's a family love. Then we have a final love, and that word is agape. And that is the word we want to focus on this evening, for it is the word, that, that form of love, agape, is what's used in this text and as we see it through most uh, of Scripture. And so... It's important that we have an accurate understanding of the word love so that, we, so that you and I uh, might be able to uh, project this or to have this same kind of love for others as God has, has it for you and I. And so first of all, we have the meaning of love. And then secondly, we have the manifestation of love, manifestation of love. First of all, uh, it's a pardoning love. As love is expressed uh, in our lives, and as we demonstrate it to other people, it will be a pardoning kind of love or forgiving love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, it says, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God 
should love his brother also. Do you remember the uh, scripture that says, if you bring your offering to the altar, and yet you have a disagreement with your brother or sister, whether it's on your part or on their part, if there's a disagreement, then you are to leave your offering at the altar and reconcile yourself with your brother or your sister first before that offer uh, uh, that you're giving to the Lord is acceptable to him. You know, that's a pardoning love. That is, we go and forgive. And too many times we want to wait for the other person to say, I'm sorry. And that's not the kind of, of love and that's not the kind of forgiveness that God has for you and for me. He has forgiven us whether we ask for it or not. And we need to extend that same kind of forgiveness to other people because the manifestation of our love, if it is agape love, a godly love, it will demonstrate itself by being a pardoning love. That is, we are going to forgive other people. Secondly, it is a proven love. It is a proven love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 24, it says, Therefore openly, before the churches, show them the proof of your love and of our reason for boasting about you. First of all, it says openly. Second of all, it says proof. So in this proven kind of love, as it manifests itself in our life, it will be seen by those around us. If you remember the scripture we read earlier, it says that we, uh, if we love God and, and yet we say we don't like our brother, we don't like our neighbor, we don't like our co-worker, we don't like that guy that sits in the pew or that gal that sits in the pew across from us, then we truly do not have love for God. Because the kind of love that God has called us to is an agape love, and it, it, it instills in us the desire to forgive others, but it also instills in us a desire to demonstrate that love, to prove it to other people. You know, uh, Jesus Christ proved his love. You see, if God just uh, was in heaven and he said, You know, uh, you guys down here, I love you. And that's all he did. We would still be sinners, except we would not have salvation. Because what did it take for God to redeem us? He demonstrated, he proved his love for us by sending Jesus to die on the cross. And the cross is the sacrifice, is the emblem, as it were, that demonstrates that he does love us, that he does love you. He proved it Th throughout the uh, years, and certainly we have it in New Testament uh, scriptures. We have it in history. There were many people, uh, they ca they're called martyrs, who gave their life because of their love for the Lord and their love for other people. And they were brutalized and murdered and so many different things that were stoned to death. Uh, and, this, and, they were and this happened to them because they were proving their love for God and for other people. And so... The true manifestation of godly love in us is that it will be proven. Thirdly, it is a precious love. There is no other love that is like the agape love. For the, the agape love is very pure. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, and Paul is speaking, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, that kind of love is very precious. That kind of love says that, uh, you know, if we don't want the carpet to be red, we're going to live with it because everybody else does. Uh, that kind of love says that if uh, uh, some of the decisions that are made and, and the church agrees to it by and large, that we're not going to get in a tiff about it and go storm off somewhere else. It's that very kind of precious love that allows us to work through some of the uh, circumstances in which we find ourselves, some of the bumps in the road. Um, I have uh, disagreed with my daughters on occasion, once in a blue moon. But they don't pack their bags and leave the house just because we disagree with one another. You see, it's a very precious kind of love. They accept me for who I am, and I accept them for who they are, even though from time to time we have a few disagreements. And that's the kind of precious love that we ought to have for each other and for those around us. That it's, it's so precious that in spite of a disagreement, in spite of, uh, of what someone else has done or said or whatever, we work through those things and we continue to love the way God loves us. You know, all we have to do if we think about somebody else who's uh, wronged us or done something we don't like, all we have to do is think about our relationship with God. See, He still loves us in spite of the dumb things we do. He still loves us in spite of the sins that we commit. He loves us in spite of those things that we think about that we ought not. He loves us in spite of the actions. He still loves us. Why? Because it's a very precious love that God has for you and for me. And that's the same kind of love that He desires for us to have for one another. 
thirdly, we have the miracle of love. First of all, we have the meaning of love. Then we have the manifestation of love. And then thirdly, we have the miracle of love. And there are two things I want to bring to your attention. The first one is the miracle of sovereign love. The miracle of a godly or a sovereign love. First of all, it's unconditional. Aren't you thankful that God's love for us is not conditional? Because if it was, it would mean that, that uh, we would have to uh, prove or we would have to do something to garner His love. But we don't have to because His love for us is unconditional. A great passage in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Jesus. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by the life of Jesus. Here's what that passage says. When we were apart from Christ, before we belonged in the family of God, He still loved you enough to die on the cross. He still wanted to reconcile your relationship with Him in such a way that He sent His Son to die on your behalf and my behalf. That's an unconditional kind of love. How many of us can love others that way? I think we struggle in that to some degree. Our love for others sometimes is based on how they react to us and what they do for us. But praise be to God, that's not the way He loves you and not the way He loves me. He loves us in spite of ourselves. He loved us when we were yet lost in our sins. That is the miracle of sovereign love. It is unconditional. Secondly, it's universal. It's universal. Se several weeks ago, I uh, delivered a message on this uh, great verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I bring to your attention once more, it said, for God so loved the world. That is, God loved everybody, you and me and everyone else. That's a universal kind of love. He loves all people. We're all the same in His eyes. Some, something that's worthy to Him. Something that's worthwhile to Him. That He would come and suffer shame and humiliation on our behalf. The miracle of love begins with the miracle of sovereign love. Secondly, there's the miracle of saintly love. That's the love. We are saints. If we belong to the family of God, we are saints in the kingdom. And there's the miracle of the saintly love, the kind of love that we have. And I, I want to focus on that word love and use it as an acronym. First of all, the letter L stands for looks for sinners. Now, if we uh, have the agape love, if we love others, and if we love God the way He loves us, first of all, we're going to look for sinners. We're going to look for them because we want them to experience what we're experiencing. We want them to have what we have in our life, salvation. In Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it says, And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges, and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. Do you notice the words there? That's an active kind of love. That's a, that's a very passionate kind of love. The kind of love that gives you the desire to go out and tell others. Hey, come inside this building. There's something going on here. The Spirit is moving in a powerful way. Come and be a part of this. Look what's happened in my life. I'm different than I used to be. Come and experience that. It's Jesus Christ. It's the moving of the Holy Spirit your life and in my life and in this church and it begins in the same love it begins by us looking for sinners do you remember this morning the second point to the normal baptist message of three points personal contact with the seeker personal contact we want to establish a growing relationship with the lord it's going to require that we look out for other people that we share jesus with other people the O in love stands for overcomes self. Scripture says that we as believers are overcomers. Not because of our own abilities, but because of Him who lives within us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, it says, But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Did you catch that? I discipline my body. That takes work. It takes blood, sweat, and tears for us to discipline our mind, our heart, our physical body. 
And we become slaves to the Lord. Why? So that after we share with other peoples, we might not be disqualified. I'll give you an example. You teach your children or you teach your co-worker, you talk to someone at school, and you say, you ought not talk like that. You ought not use those kind of words, those four-letter words or derogatory words that you use. And then you go along your business and you stub your toe or you hit your thumb with a hammer or something happens in your life that you're less than pleasant about, and what comes out? If it's the same things you're telling others not to do, you have disqualified yourself. See, if you're trying to encourage and teach and to equip other people to live a godly and righteous life, but yet you are falling far short, then you disqualify yourself. And Paul says, don't do that. Discipline your body. Discipline your mind. Discipline your heart so that you can be conformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ so that when you say to others the teachings of God, you will not be disqualified. I'm not talking about perfection. We all fall way short. Lord knows I fall way, way short. In fact, I'm not even in the same league. But that doesn't mean that we can express the truths of the Bible if we are trying to live it out, even with the sin and the stumblings that occur in our life. And by this discipline, by living in the power of the Holy Spirit, we overcome the natural tendencies of our flesh, the things that we would like to do. The V in love stands for visions a goal. Visions a goal. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Uh, another translation says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. I like this version better because... Uh, it says the people are unrestrained. And here's what it means. If, if, if you don't have a vision, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but if you don't have a vision, if you don't have something you're pointing towards, something to accomplish for the kingdom of God, then it means you're going to do whatever you want to do. It means you're going to do what, what your own mind decides it's going to do. And so do you have a vision? I think, I am convinced that not only does every Christian need a vision, but the church corporately needs a vision. Patillo Baptist Church needs a vision. What do I mean by that? Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a goal of where we want to be in five years? Do we have a goal of where we want to be next year, three years, ten years, fifty years? That's what I mean by vision. See, if we have a vision, and not something we concoct ourselves, but corporately, we're seeking God and seeking His inspiration. Say, Lord, what do you have for us? Where should we go? What direction do we need to head down? And as He gives us that vision, then we're all going to be united to work towards that goal. Do you agree with that? See, if we don't have a vision, if we don't have something that we're convinced the Lord wants us to work towards, then we're going to flounder. We're just going to do our own little thing. Whatever it is, is the desire of our own heart. And so we need a vision. You need it in your own personal life. Where do you want to be spiritually a year from now? Five years from now? Ten years from now? We need a vision. The E in love stands for encouraging others. Encouraging others. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses thir uh, 3 and 4 say, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are, in, who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Here's what it's saying. You ever come across those people that when you ask them how they're doing, they actually tell you? They take up about 30 minutes of your time and tell you all the things that's wrong in their life? Uh, you know, it's funny uh, what we do as, uh, as, uh, as Americans, I guess. I don't know that. I think it's just us. We walk up, we say, how you doing? We really don't mean it. We just want to say hello. How you doing? So when someone starts to tell us how they're doing, we go, boy, what did I get into? I didn't mean for all that. But, but you, you come across people that every time you ask them how they're doing, they give you a whole uh, laundry list of things that are wrong in their life. And you're going, wow, do they ever smile? Do they ever have joy in life? Is there anything that they're looking forward to? Is there anything that delights their heart? Because every time you talk to them, there's always something wrong. You know, if they're not encouraged themselves, they're certainly not going to encourage others. Now, there are times when things come in our life that we need to seek out the brethren. We need, we need that comfort and we need that support and we need the prayers. And that's great. That's what we're here for. But you have to ask yourself, is there, is there always something wrong? Or are, are you one of those people that when someone asks how you're doing, there's always something wrong? It's always on the negative side? Do you know someone like that? 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Why does He do that? Why does He comfort us in our affliction? Why? So that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. You see, when trials and tribulations come your way, God wants to comfort you. And uh, Paul writes that uh, as he tried to uh, get away from that thorn, uh, uh, God said, uh, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. It will overcome that thorn that's in your flesh. And as we are living in our life and circumstances which we wish we weren't in, God says, take comfort, my grace is sufficient. And if we accept that promise and claim it, then we'll be a comfort to other people. One of the great joys that I have, and I'm sure you echo the same, is being around saints that you know are suffering, whether it's from an illness, whether it's financially, uh, Satan's attacking, whatever it may be, and yet they're standing strong. They're standing firm in the faith. And in spite of their circumstances, they are proclaiming Jesus Christ. They are praising the Savior. I love to be around those kind of people, don't you? I do, because they strengthen my heart. They give me hope. They give me courage. Never been around a martyr, but in the early centuries when the martyrs would die, and they died terrible deaths, they would flash that victory sign that says, in spite of what you're seeing, that it is tolerable. There is victory in Jesus Christ. I have trouble understanding that, how someone could do that while they're being burned at the stake. How they could do that when hot oil is being poured on their body. When their arms are literally ripped from their sockets. Flashing the victory sign. God's grace is sufficient in all things. We need to encourage others. If we claim that victory, we will be an encouragement to other people. Well, we've looked at the meaning of love, the manifestation of love, the miracle of love. And finally, let's look at the ministry of love. Now, agape love calls for each one of us to love the hope of Christianity. To love the hope of Christianity. Are you in love with the gospel? First of all, you've got to be in love with Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Savior and Lord before you can get to this point. But if you are a member in the family of God, do you love the gospel? Do you love the hope that Christianity offers to the world? Because if you don't, if you're indifferent towards it, if it doesn't mean that much to you, then that agape love is not present in your life. Do you have a desire to tell others about the hope of Jesus Christ? The hope that was given to you, that you accepted? Agape love calls for that. Agape love calls for each one of us to love the home. Now, I know some of our homes are maybe not the best it ought to be. Maybe we had parents that, that uh, weren't the best, or maybe some, sometimes as teens we didn't act the way our parents wanted us to act. But God still calls us to love the home. He loves us in spite of some of us that are rebellious. He still loves us. And if we have that agape kind of love, we'll love the home. We'll also love the house of God. We'll love the house of God. Now, uh, someone can tell me that they love to be at church all they want to. Oh, I love being with God's people. I love being at the church. If I only see them once a month or a couple times a month, they can say that till they're blue in the face, and I'm never going to believe them. Because if they truly do love the church, if they truly do love the house of God, if they truly do love the fellowship of their brothers and sisters, they would be here. They wouldn't be somewhere else. See, because where, where, where our heart is, where the love is in our heart, that's where we're going to be at. So we need to love the house of God. And we need to love the holy book. I talked about this morning, uh, about the scriptures, having personal contact with the scriptures. It means that we need to have a love for this book. Now, I know there are some translations that are hard to read. You know, there are some that I pick up and, and I, well, you know, I'd rather read another version. But you know what? There are a lot of translations now. We didn't have that luxury 20, 30, 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. We had just a few versions. But now we've got all kinds of versions. And whatever level you're at, there's a, there's a version that will meet your needs. This uh, book is inspiring. This book will fill your life and my life with the wisdom and the encouragement and the love of God. But it's not going to do us any good on the bookshelf. It's not going to do us any good on the coffee table. We need to open it up and read it. And we need to open it up and study it. And the parts that we don't understand, <laughs> seek help. Ask me or go to other kinds of books and get help. 
We need to love the holy book. Here's the way I look at it. If I want to have a conversation with God, I can talk to Him in prayer. But you know what else I can do? I can open up His Word. He's got all kinds of things He's saying to me right here in this book. We need to love the book, the holy book. We need to love the heavenly messenger. That is, we need to love those that God has placed in positions of authority to shepherd the flock. We need to love those people, whoever they may be. And we need to love the messenger that just comes to us on behalf of what God has to say in your life. Not to shut them out, but to listen to them and to love them. We need to love the hopeless sinner. We need to love the hopeless sinner. How many of us cringe when we see or we're talking to a lost person? And, and, and we, we cringe because we so desperately want them to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Or how many of us are indifferent to that? It, it doesn't strike a chord with us at all. It doesn't matter to us. If it doesn't matter to us, then we're not having that agape kind of love. We need to love the hopeless sinner. We need, also need to love the holy brethren. We need to love each other. We need to love each other. The believer's passion is an all-consuming love. It's the kind of love that you wake up with in the morning and it motivates your life. It's the kind of love that you live out the whole day and that when you get in bed at night, you can't wait till the next day so you can do it all over again. That's what an agape love is. It means you spend some nights wrestling in bed because God is causing you to think. God is causing you to have a vision. God is causing you to think about some, some of the things that you'd like to happen in your life or in the life of the church. When's the last time you spent a sleepless night because God was working in your life, for good or for bad? He was trying to convict you or He was trying to teach you something or take you down a road. When's the last time that's happened in your life? For some of us, it might be quite a while. This, this consuming kind of love, this is what it does to us. It, we think about it all the time, and we feel it, and we experience it, and we live it out. That's the kind of love God has for you, and that's the kind of love He wants us to have, not only for Him, but for others. It's the kind of love that's very present in our life. So let me ask you this. Is that love present in your life? Is it? If it's not present in your life, Several things might need to occur. First of all, it might be that you're not in the family of God. It might mean that you need to say yes to Jesus and invite Him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Let me say this about, about that salvation experience. It's not a magic formula. You, you can say till you're blue in the face, I want Jesus to come into my heart. But if you never mean it in your heart, it doesn't mean anything. You see, it's not the words that you say, and it's not the prayer that we say together. That's not a magic formula. What really seals your salvation is your heart crying out to God saying, Lord, I want you as my Savior in my heart. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. That's in the heart. And the way that it comes out is, is that it's expressed in words. And it's, it's uh, expressed through prayer. And so if you don't have this kind of agape love in your life, it might be that you don't have Jesus in your life. Secondly, it might be that you've left your first love. It might be that you've severed or strained that relationship with God, that you're doing your own thing apart from Him, in which case you can't express that agape love to others if it's not present in your own life, and you need to rededicate your life. You need to go to the Lord and say, I'm sorry for living apart from you. And starting today on, I'm going to live for you the best I know how. So you have some decisions to make. What kind of love do you have? Is it the agape kind of love? If not, you might need to accept Christ or you might need to rededicate your life. What's God calling you to? Would you stand with me for a word of prayer?